Okay. We are going to do what we call the Digging Deeper Workshop, or it's really designed to help you grow in the One Year Bible and how to spend time with Jesus. So you've gotten a couple of things, a couple of documents that I've given you. And so the reason this is so important to me is a little bit of my testimony. You guys have heard it a couple of times or heard pieces of it. But when I was growing up, I was growing up in the Catholic Church, and my perspective of God was that he would smile on you when you were good. When you were bad, you had to go in a box and tell a man what you'd done, and he'd tell you what you had to do to get rid of your sin, okay? And that he did good things for good people and bad things for bad people. And so in my mind, that's kind of how I grew up and just thinking that, and I just remember always trying to make God happy. And then I could figure out that he could even know what you were thinking. And so then I was like, now I'm really in trouble because I didn't understand sin nature. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew that a lot of times what was going on inside of me <laughs> did not want to do what I was supposed to be doing, right? What was expected of me, right? And so that kind of was this struggle. My dad was also the lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps and, um, he had a really hard life. And so he put himself through college and everything. And so he was one of those guys that if I came home with a B, he'd say, why don't you get an A? And if you made junior varsity, he'd say, why don't you make varsity? And I just love my dad and I wanted to make him happy. Right. So I know now that he was just trying to encourage me to be the best version of me that I could be. But back then, my little head said, if you like, if you do better, I'll love you more. So love was conditional in my mind in doing good and in performing, both with my father and with God, right? And I had an amazing mom who was my best friend. And you guys have kind of heard me share that at 17, trauma hit and my mom got cancer and then she passed away. And so for me, that was really challenging because my mom loved God. Like my mother loved the Lord and she would drag us to do all these God things. We would go to the old people's homes. We would help people. And so for me, it was very confusing because if God blessed people who did good and he punished people who did bad, she was good. So why did she get cancer and die? So in my mind, God broke his rules and he couldn't be trusted. Like, and so what's the point of doing the right thing if it doesn't matter anyway? And so at that time with a lot of pain in my heart, right? And a lot of not knowing what to do with my life at that point, I couldn't run to God because it was kind of his fault. And so of course the world offered me things to help with the pain, like the drugs, like the alcohol, like, um, you know, someone to love you. And it spiraled into a really bad life of addiction, right? And so, um, and I tried lots of things to change it, about five or six different rehabs. I told you I've been to jail a little bit and no hope, no hope, no hope. You know, maybe modifying behavior for a minute, but then still just struggling, right? And so a friend of mine, again, her name was Jackie, and she was just as messed up as me, maybe more. And uh, she gave her heart to the Lord and she was getting married and she wanted me to be there. And she knew that my current boyfriend had gone to jail. So they went to jail to find me. And basically she came and she shared the gospel with me. She told me about Jesus. And I made fun of her, but she told me Jesus was who changed her, right? And at that time, I always tell people because I wasn't very nice to her. I rejected her, but in my heart, I filed that because there was something different. Like you could see it, right? She was different and she told me Jesus did it. So when I was in my darkest hour of hopelessness and I had tried everything else, right? I thought, um, I really just wanted to die. I shared that with you guys the other day. My heart was just like, there's no reason to live. I can't find hope in anything else. I had experienced lost. I had hurt people that I loved. I had 
been in five different rehabs. I'd gone to jail. I'd been in counseling, all the things, no hope, no hope, no hope. Right. And so why do you want to live? And then I just remembered giving, like thinking about Jesus and thinking, I'm going to give you my life, Lord. Okay. Cause Jackie had told me about it. And like I was giving him a prize, right? It was just a train wreck, but I had felonies. I was a mess, but I'm going to give you my life and I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Like I follow drugs, like I follow men, like I follow everything else. And if you're not real, I said, I'll go out and I'll die using. And that was kind of my plan. And I didn't know much, but I knew that Jackie went to a Calvary Chapel down the street. And so I just went there, right? I just said, okay. First thing Christians do is you go to church, right? And so I'm going to go to church. And so it just, I remember walking in and it was just different. Like the worship was happening and then the word of God was being taught. And I kind of felt like they were reading my diary. You know what I mean? Because I felt like every message was for me. Uh, I hadn't cried in years because my heart was so hard, but I just felt like the worship would just penetrate my heart. And so I just remember, okay, like something's different here. And then what happened was I, if church was on, I was in it. Okay. Cause otherwise I was, I was going to get high again. And I just was like, I needed to be there. And so I think it was this church was on Sunday and they announced that they had a women's Bible study on Monday night or Tuesday night. I don't remember. So I went to women's Bible study, which was really scary right? Because I really did look scary. I had sores all over my body. I weighed about 9102 about that time. And I'm six foot. And I had to walk into a church in a pair of mini skirt and stilettos, because that's what I knew to wear. And all the church ladies were there, you know. And so um, that was scary for me. But I was desperate. And I tell everyone I had the gift of desperation. And what happened was there was a woman, and you guys have met my friend Debbie. She's about this big, four foot eleven. And she was standing up there with a one-year Bible. And she said it really emphatically, like she does, girls, you've got to read your Bible. Well, I'm like, okay, rule number one, you read your Bible. And she's like, if you gotta read your Bible every day right? So I looked around and thought that's just what Christians do. If you're going to be a Christian, you got to read your Bible. Okay. And so I got really discouraged though, because I had tried reading my Bible before and it just didn't make sense to me. You know what I mean? But not only did she teach us to read the Bible, but she taught us how. But I'll tell you what was the most memorable part for me about that night was the way she talked about the Lord right? was like she sat down and had breakfast with him that morning, right? There was an intimacy that she talked about God with that I didn't know you could have, nor did I want with the God that I knew, you know what I mean? And so what happened was is she taught us and I took lots of notes and then I went home and I did exactly what she said. So this is a little bit about what she taught. And over the years, she gave it to me and I changed it and I changed it a little more. And then, um, but it changed my life, right? Because I met Jesus. And so I want to share it with you, right? Because it did, it transformed my life. It changed how I saw him, right? Um, I opened up God's word, and I tell you this all the time, because when I started to do it, I didn't do it because I wanted to, right? I did it because it was what she told me to do. I didn't feel like doing it, right? But I spent time in my word every day, and she would tell me to look for the character in the heart of God. You hear that all the time, personal relationship. You're going to be in a personal relationship with Jesus. And you're like, how can I be in a personal relationship with someone that I can't see, feel, or touch, right? And then the other thing that would always happen is someone would say, well, the Lord told me this, right? The Lord told me that. And you don't want to seem dumb, but you want to go, well, how did he tell you that? 
And the Lord answered this question, or he showed this, or he spoke this to me. And you're like, I didn't know God could do that. And the God that I knew, again, if he spoke to you, you would run, right? But she said to look for the character and the heart of God, to take a journey for the heart of God. And as you, as I began to do what she said and step into God's word, I met him places. And I, I remember meeting him, like looking into Mark chapter five, where you meet the demoniac, right? There was a crazy man living in the tombs, which really resonated with my life because I was living among the dead people and the guy would scratch himself and hurt himself. And anytime anybody tried to help him, he would break free and he would hurt himself some more, right? Which was such a picture of my life, no matter how many times people tried to help me. And you were living among the dead. It was crazy. Nobody wanted anything to do with you. That was my life. And Jesus didn't go, you gross me out. I don't want anything to do with you. In fact, he went across to help that man. And he inter- he interacted in his life, right? And and his life got different. Then I'm, he, I met him at the well. Like a lot of times she'd say, step into the story, put yourself there, right? And look at Jesus and see the heart of God. And so I looked at the well where there was a woman that he met and he offered her something. He didn't want anything from her. He offered her something. In fact, he told her in John chapter four, I have what you need. He said, if you drink of any of this water, you're going to be thirsty again. Well, I had just lived a life of addiction where I drank of all kinds of water over here, relationship, and I kept ending up empty. But if you drink of what I have, he said, right? He said, it'll be, and he didn't, and then he found out, we found out she had five husbands and I lived a pretty promiscuous life. And he didn't look at her and say, you tramp, right? So he treated her different. So all of a sudden, who God is being revealed to from his word is different from what I know. So one of us is wrong, and it's probably not his word, right? So it began to change how I saw him, okay? And so when Debbie talked to us, she said, this is going to be the most important relationship of your life. And if this is a relationship that can um, change your life, you need to know who God is, know the heart of God. So that's what I'm going to teach you, what she taught me. I'm going to teach you what I've been teaching girls for a long time. It changed the way I spend time with the Lord. I'm not going to teach you to do devotions. I don't want, I don't want another checklist, but I'm going to just teach you some ways to spend time with Jesus to devote time to being with him, right? It's not doing devotions. It's devoting your time to being with him and hearing from him and learning how to hear him speak to you through his word, okay? So we're going to go through this first one, which is called personal time with Jesus, right? And then I'm going to teach you on the back a little bit about some tools to dig deeper. And then we're going to actually put it into practice, okay? So it's a, so the first time you can kind of just follow along. It's all on here. You can write on here if you want. But, you know, the purpose, here's the idea. Like if you can get this, your brain around this, that the Lord of the universe wants to spend some time with you. Everywhere in his word, there's an invitation to come, right? Come and draw near to him, he said. And he wants to draw near to you. He wants you to know him and he wants wants to know you. That's a pretty powerful moment, right? And so he said, um, and knowing him isn't just like knowing about him. I know that we're here in the South and a lot of people I knew about God, a lot of you've been to church and you know about him, but the word know that is used is a very intimate word. And it's the same kind of word like I know, like I know who President Trump is, right? But I know my sister, my father, the difference is relationship. And the no that is used there is that intimate relationship. And he tells you this, he tells us in John 17, he says, eternal life. What, what eternal life is, is knowing God, 
knowing him intimately, and Jesus Christ, whom he said. And then he tells us that in Psalm 40, that he comes in the volume of the book. He says, I am revealed through my word. That's how you can know God. That's what it is. It's his story from Genesis to the book of Revelation, no S on the end, because it's the revelation of Jesus, right? And so the whole thing is about him. So he's right, like, and he tells that his boys, when he leaves, he says, when he ascends into heaven after he said, I want you to make disciples. And the word disciple means a learner, a follower. And in the root of that word is the word discipline, right? Same word we get from discipline. I want you to make disciples, people who follow me. He doesn't want you to make believers, right? Even the demons believe. But he said, I want you to be disciples. And then in John, he says, you are my disciple if you continue in my word, right? So you can't be a true disciple without reading God's word. Because right there in John, it says, you are my disciple if you continue in my word, right? And there's a lot of places where people will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you, right? We didn't have a relationship. So he's trying to teach you how to sit down and have a relationship with him. So that's kind of the purpose. The God of the universe wants to, you to know him. He knows you, but he really wants you to know that he knows you, right? So there's this relationship. Okay, first, the next thing I'll tell you is to make it a priority. If you think about your phones and who you have in your favorites list, who do you have in your favorites list? Your boys, people that are the most important to you in your relationships, right? And this is a relationship that should be the most important. And you make time for people who you love right? You make time to spend with people you love. Now, he, you're new at knowing him, but this should be the most important relationship in your life because he's the one that holds the words of life. He's the one that has everything in his hands. The Bible contains everything that pertains to life and godliness, and he's all that you need. So he wants you to make this a priority, right? To spend time with him. And he longs to be with you. And he says, I want to be your daily bread, right? We don't just eat once a week when we go, like we eat every day, most of us a few times a day, right? And he's like, you spiritually, you need daily bread too. You can't just go once on Sunday and get fed, right? And so um, he has what you need for each day, right? And are you guys the same every day? Do you need different things, different days? Do you need different things in different seasons? Absolutely. So he says, I have your, I'm your daily bread. I'm what you need today. And that's why it's not like I'm going to get up and I'm going to read. Oh, I know this story. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. It's more like, well, Lord, what do you have for me today? Right. And then having a plan. So often, remember when I would like I would end up playing Bible roulette, like someone say, you got to read your Bible. And I'm like, OK, I don't know where to read. And you open it up and you go like, OK, here. Right. And you just pick something. And it would always be something weird, like God killed them all or he smote them or, you know, something like they're cutting. I don't know, even the Philistine thing where they're cutting off foreskins and you're like, what? You know what I mean? And so it's like, OK, so having a plan right? And reading the whole counsel of God. There are lots of Bible reading plans out there, but it removes the guesswork. So I love the one-year Bible, right? Because it is the Bible broken up into a year. It's an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, a Psalm and a Proverb, and it's on each day, right? So I don't have to wonder every day I get up, I know exactly where I'm going, right? And so I'm not, I don't care what plan you use. I've used different plans over the years. I've used different versions of the one year Bible. One year I did a chronological, just have a plan. So you know where you're going, right? Okay, some practical tools, right? This is important. Now you guys are in a ministry right now. So some of these are built in for you, right? But personalize the pace, okay? Be realistic 
about your journey. If you're reading the one year, you may decide that for right now, you're only going to read the New Testament section this year, right? If you're a student or if you've got kids or something and you may not have time to sit down like we do every morning and you got 45 minutes and you can sit there for another hour, you know what I mean? So personalize your pace. You know, it's it's much better to be consistent with a smaller portion than to be overwhelmed too much. I would rather have you go deep with a little bit than to go wide. Okay. Especially when you're new, just trying to take in too much, right? Just a small section being consistent, right? And then don't try to catch up if you miss a day, right? That's crazy. Like when you're not here. Because then you're like, I got to go back and read. And and it's that will mess you up too. Just start where you're at. You know, just start where you're at. Okay, find a time. Everybody has a personal rhythm. Some of you are morning people, right? Some of you are nighttime people. Some of us are both and we're just really jacked up. But I would make an appointment. Like just kind of put it on your calendar like we do here. That's why we're modeling this for you. Every morning we get up at the same time. I would set my alarm and I would get up at the same time, right? Every morning and I would spend time with the Lord. Um, I did. She told us to set an alarm and put it across the room. I found out what time I had to go to work, how long it took me to get ready. And I backed it up an hour so that I could have time to read the Lord. And I put my alarm up. I would get up. And I would have a reminder because I had an appointment with the Lord, okay? And every morning I would meet with them there, right? Then prepare a place, like have a spot when you leave here, just kind of your spot, right? Preparing a place where you got a notebook, you got a pen, you got a certain time, um, and they're all right here. Like, listen, what happens in the morning? I trip in, I get my coffee because it's already made. I go over to my spot. Everything's there because I can just get right down and get in it. If I have to get up and go get something, right? I'm like, oh, wait, I didn't put the wash in. Oh, I need to empty the trash. And all of a sudden my time gets sucked out, right? And then, you know, what kind of happens? It kind of becomes like this special place that we meet. I call it my holy ground. Like I got this chair. I remember when we rearranged my living room, I was like, God, are you going to speak to me over there too? You know what I mean? It's like, Because we just had our place, right? So just get your little spot. I got a little basket. You know, I got a little blanket. Now I got a fireplace and I just, it's all right there. It's always right there. And it's just my place where I meet with Jesus. And we do laugh about it. It's just sometimes it feels like holy ground. It's my spot. Paper and pen. Um, while you're here, right, that's not really optional, although I know that a couple of girls don't use theirs and I'm going to spank them, but paper and pen, um, you are really telling the Lord, Hey, I'm here. I'm paying attention. I want to listen to you. Right. And you know that letting the Lord know that you're expecting him to say something to you and it's going to be important enough that you're going to write it down and then remember it. You know, you retain like double if you write something down, right? And when that doubles your retention. And then it just, a lot of times too, I don't know if you're like me, but thoughts bounce around in here in my head and they don't always get linear, right? They're kind of like this and this and this and this and this. But if I take my pen and I start writing, stuff starts coming out and then it expands, right? Sarah's an expander. She's got, right. But it expands and then it sort of tunnels. If I don't do that, lots of half-baked ideas bounce around in there. But when I start writing it down, it changes. Does that make sense? Okay. Always begin with prayer. Just, God, I'm here. Um, Will you open my eyes to see wonderful things? Will you help me hear your voice? Right. Always asking him. And then I had a little bit of a process, like that idea of how, how do I hear your voice? How do I get to know him? Um, How do I read the Bible with some purpose? Again, there's lots of ways out there. If you've been, K. Arthur does precepts, there's a soap method, there's all kinds of ways. I don't really care which one you use. I like this one because it was simple. And my brain was pretty simple and it felt intimate. But your focus is really coming to know God. 
and taking the truths that he teaches you and applying them to your life. Okay. The tools to dig deeper that I use and have been using are really simple and they're effective. Okay. So flip it over and we're going to talk about some tools. Okay. Um, on the back page, it's called tools to dig deeper. So one of the things that I would tell you is read with curiosity. Okay. You know how people watch reality TV shows and we kind of stare into people's lives. Right. And you wonder what they're, but do that with God's word. Like who's in this story? What's going on? When, how, what's happening here? And he said, if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're going to be filled. And so stepping into the word sometimes and not just reading a Bible story for some of you that have been around forever, like this is Daniel in the lion's den or this is the woman at the well, but like step into the story, like think about what she's feeling, what God was doing, what's going on there. And then reading with purpose. Like, I'm not trying to just do a drive-by. I Do I want to grow? Do I want to change? Do I want to know what God says? Do I want to walk with him? Am I desiring to start to please him? I live in a dark world. Do I want to be a light? Do you want to have some victory over your sin? Like, if I'm going to read with purpose, um, God's word is living and powerful, and it'll change you if you let it. Okay. But if you want to just check off, I read my Bible, that'll happen too, right? Um, and then listen, pay attention because God is trying to speak to you, right? Ask the Holy Spirit every day, like, what do you have for me today, God? What do you want to highlight for me? Ask him to give you fresh manna and give you fresh bread um, and, you know, develop a system of your own, Okay. I didn't know you can write in your Bible, right? I thought you could go to hell for that, but it become, comes to find out you can. And especially in your one years, right? We give them to you, write in them, underline things, circle things. I have a little system. If it's somebody's name, I put a box around it. If it's something really cool that I want you guys to know, I'll put a star by it. If it's something personal that God's like there's a big old arrow right here. If there's somebody's initials that I think it's for, I write them and I put a circle. You know, I have a system. I have little dots. Some people use colored pencils. It's your word. Like, God, what do you got for me? Right. Sometimes if I don't understand something, I'll put a question mark next to it. It's like, just come up with a way and you're, you're going to study here. And then you're going to ask yourself a couple of questions. Okay. And First question I kind of ask myself as I sit there and go, God, what do you have for me today? What are you highlighting? What you might be teaching me? What are you revealing to me personally? What can I learn from? Can I pull a lesson from today's reading? Did I learn something, right? Um, he wants to teach you how to live a godly life and how to live according to his word, not according to the culture, not the way Oprah or Dr. Phil says, but him, right? And so What's his plan for your life? And he tells you that all scripture is inspired by him and he will use it to correct you, to instruct you. We talk about that a lot. So he's teaching you how to live according to his word. So his word will provide instructions, directions, comfort, and all so much more. And so you want to trust and believe God instead of your own thoughts, right? Feelings and your world's influence. So you're going to ask him, what do you have for me today? God, what do you want to show me? What do you want to teach me? Right? What's in there? What can I learn? And then number two is really important because listen, a lot of you have been in church a long time. So you can pull a spiritual principle, a spiritual truth out of God's word. And that's awesome. You can write it down and you can say, I learned this. God says not to be afraid. Okay. You can pull up a spiritual principle out. God forgave someone and he wants us to forgive. But it's not until you do this next step, step two, where you say, Lord, I see what you showed me. How does that play out in my life, God? Right? How does it relate to what I want? How does it relate to my desires, my fears, my priorities? And how can I take what you're showing me right now and apply it to my life? Like go deep and get personal. 
And that's what sometimes when we're doing our devotions and some of the girls have been here a long time and I will go, what does that mean to you? Because I, I know some things and I don't need you just to retell me what it says. I want to know how that impacted you. If God is saying, don't be afraid, right? How does that impact me? God, do I have fear? Asking yourself questions when you see him teaching you something, asking questions of yourself based on what God's trying to teach you. God, am I afraid? God, if I am, what am I afraid of, Lord? What does my fear keep me from doing, right? How do I respond? Where's my heart in all this stuff? Um, certain situations, will I trust and obey? And just being honest, because he already knows, right? And sometimes I'll wrestle things out with God right there on my piece of paper. Okay, you say trust and obey, right? And so um, what's God's purpose for my life? How do you define all these things? Am I truly a disciple? Like asking yourself questions. And a lot of times I'll come away with an action step. You know what I mean? Like something that I know he wants me to do or change based on what he taught me and about what I learned. Right. Okay. Um, then the next thing, a lot of times, a lot of times we did this one first, but I started doing it after number three because once I learned something from him, once he revealed some things about me to me and I discovered some things, then I would stop and go, God, what did I learn about your character today? What did I learn about your heart? What did I learn from my personal reading and application? And this is really your goal is to know him. And so if I, like, you told me not to be afraid, God, because you love me. You know that I am scared, so you understand me. You want me to acknowledge my fears, God, so there's some compassion. This is where you understand that he wants you to seek him. He said, if you seek for him and search him, you're going to find who he is. He reveals himself in your word, he says, with your whole heart and soul. And he said, you know, um, he said he wants you to see his ways, his will, his promises, his power, his strength. My God was really little. And sometimes you need to look in and see a God who tells the waves to be quiet, right? And yet can care for and tell you about your heart just so much and learn that he, how he responds. Like I told you, when I saw how he responded to sinners, right? When I saw him touch a leper that nobody had touched, and the, he said, Lord, if, if you want to, you can make me well. And the Lord said, I want to. Like, that wasn't a God I knew. So, you know, discover how he deals with your fears, with your failures, with your sin. And then sometimes discover who he is. When I was a single girl, he would speak to me a lot, like being my husband and being my father and directing my steps, right? Um, but sometimes he's a friend. Sometimes he's a father. Sometimes he's a good shepherd. It just depends what I need that day. He reveals something to me. So I really want you to see who he is. Okay. Um, also, um, at the very end, what we do then when he teaches you a truth, shows you how it applies to your eye, reveals something of his character to you, then you pray back to him, right? You say, God, thank you for showing me this. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. And then you ask him for his help in doing, Lord, you see my fears, you know what I'm afraid of. Could you help me? So this is the part a lot of times I wouldn't get right. I would kind of get my marching orders and then I would run out and try to do them and forgot to invite them in to help me. And I would fail miserably, right? So this praying back to him, thanking him for what he showed you, and then asking him, right, to help you do what he said. And this is how a conversation happens. I want you to really understand that. You sat down and you said, Lord, what do you have for me today? You opened up his word, right? 
and he revealed some truths to you. You took those truths, you wrote them down and you said, God, if this is your heart, my pastor in Maine used to say, you want to know God's heart. You want to know his will. You want to hear his voice, read his word out loud, right? Because this is him telling you. And then when you respond and go, okay, I heard you say, don't be afraid, but these are my fears, God. Can you help me? You are having a conversation with the Lord. Can you see that? It's not a one-way prayer where you're just like giving him your laundry list. It's not a one-way here, thus saith the Lord, and you're just listening, listening, listening. You're taking in, you're responding, you're asking for his help. There's a relationship there, okay? I remember... Um, I used to walk into church and there was a lady in this women's Bible study group. And every time I walked in, she looked like she was just like a firecracker. And she would be like, don't you just love Jesus like that? And she just was super like, don't you just love Jesus? And because I'm comparing my insides with your outsides and I'm trying to do the Jesus thing, I like if I want to be honest, like, no. Nothing in me feels like you look right now, right? So so I'm feeling, I go home and I'm thinking, I don't love Jesus because I don't look like that, right? And this was life-changing for me because Satan just beat me up. And he said, if you love Jesus, you would have some associated emotion. She loves Jesus and you can tell. Right. And I wanted to love Jesus at this point because I knew that he died for my sins and he forgiven me. I wanted to love him, but I didn't feel anything like love towards him. Right. And then I got really scared, too, because I had felt love or what I thought was love a number of times in my life. And it turned out to be very hurtful and harmful. So I didn't trust my love monitor or like my love meter. <laughs> like, I don't even know, right? And so it was so confusing for me. And this was one of the first times that I felt like I really heard God speak to me because I was really struggling with that. And I opened up my Bible and I remember writing on the top of my page, God, I want to love you, but I, I don't know how, right? And I'm afraid that I don't. Right, because she loves you. So I remember writing that up on my page, and then I start reading in John 14. And I get down to this one, and I did this whole thing. God, will you speak to me today? Will you help me, Lord? You know what I'm struggling with, right? And in John 14, 15, do you know what it says? If you love me, obey. And it was like the Holy Spirit took his spotlight, and he went like this. And he said, if you love me, obey. And I stopped right there and I wrote that down and I said, if you love me, obey. And, so, and then it said in the border, it says, since you love me, right, obey. And so I remember thinking as I started to write my little notes, God, you told me in this little scripture that I could demonstrate my love to you through what? Obedience. You didn't say feel anything. You didn't say have any emotion. You said, if you want to show me you love me, you can do that through your obedience. And so for me, that got life changing because it didn't say feel. It didn't say have a warm, squishy feeling. And it's and I do love you. And so the next thing was, I was like, I'm OK, I'm going to obey. I can show you I love you through my obedience. Right. And then I immediately right after that, I got super excited and then I got super freaked out because I went, uh oh, I've never been a very good obeyer, God. <laughs> right. That's not been my strength. And the Lord said, Peggy, you have obeyed. Like I, I remember telling him that he said, Peg, have you ever obeyed? And I started thinking about it. And I did. I obeyed my desires. Right. I obeyed my drugs. I went wherever they wanted me to go. I obeyed some very stupid men right? I obeyed a lot of things that were trying to destroy me. And he said, but you've never obeyed me. And so um, the first year of my walk, my word was obey. My word was obey. Like if your word says it, God, I'm going to try to do it. I want to obey because obedience will show you that I love you, right? Now that wasn't easy, especially if you didn't ask God for help. 
So, but I want to tell you how one little sentence changed my life, right? And so I want that for you. So now we're going to try it. Okay. I'm going to put this on pause and we are going to try it. We're going to take John chapter five, right? And I'm going to kind of walk you through it. And I'm going to kind of we're going to do a directed step and then we'll just see how it goes. And you already have an A, so nobody has to worry about that, right? Everybody has an A. So let me just pause this. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to stop and we're going to pray and we're going to say to the Lord, what do you have for me? Now, I'll tell you a little trick that I do every morning on the top of my Bible on the day that I write T-Y-J, thank you, Jesus. And I start by thanking him for some things from yesterday, for some things, just because it puts my head in that place of gratitude, right? Thank you, Jesus. And then the next thing I kind of do is I say, Lord, there's, so I put a little things on my heart that I'm sinking your will about, right? And that's where I wrote things like, do I love you or someone I'm praying for? And I'll write a name I'll write a situation. I will pray. For, I'll put my husband or or if I have a study or whatever I'm doing, I'll put some questions there, some things that are on my heart, some things that I want to know his will with. And then I will just say, OK, Lord. I'm here. What do you have for me today? Right. And so that does a couple of things. It helps those things that are in my brain go down on a piece of paper. So I've given them to the Lord and asked for his help so I don't get super distracted by him, right? And then I pray, and I'm going to do that for you now. Lord, what do you have for each one of us right now? As we read through John chapter 5, the first eight verses, God, would you show us some things? Would you help us step into this story? Would you help each one of us just have you highlight some things and then dissect them a little bit? So we just pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Let's do this. Okay, so everybody pick something. You looked at the angel stirred the water. That kind of stuck out at you. You guys looked at the last verse that sort of said, right? Um, so that he's made you well, go and sin no more. You looked at the place, right, where you said, Jesus knew that he had been in that condition for a long time, right? And for me, when I looked at it, the thing that kind of really jumped out at me was that Jesus asked him a question, do you want to be made well? That was interesting to me that Jesus asked him that. And the other thing that kind of jumped out at me was that when he asked him that, he didn't really answer him. He just gave him all the reasons he couldn't be made well. Right. So those were the two things that kind of jumped out at me. And so some of you went a little bit deeper already and you started to think about why. But this is when I want you to go. You already said something, but I want you to go a little bit deeper a lot. And I want you to use first person. OK, I don't want you to talk about we need to when we get well, I want you to go, God, when you make me well, I need to be careful. Right. So I want you to take what he showed you. If he showed you that he knows the condition the man had been in, why does that matter in your life, right? What did that stirring the water represent to you? And what was he trying to tell you now about the going and sinning no more? God, am I going to do that? So I want you to take this next section and I want you to go deeper and make it personal. Does that make sense? You learned a spiritual principle. You all pulled one out of there. He showed you something in his word that he knows your condition, that he wants you to be careful not to go sin anymore, that he stirs up the waters. Why does that matter in your life? And how does it apply? Ready? Go a little deeper now. Go. Okay, so we all just went a little bit deeper. Everybody took something, right? talked about how he said, go and sin no more. I've begun the healing process and, and 
you guys made it personal. You made it personal because you do want to be made whole. You recognize that he sees you personally, right? And that's the idea. You talked about stirring that up in you and wanting to do things different. So now you've had a conversation. He's revealed something to you. You've taken it. You've meditated on it. You've applied it to your life. You've written it down. Now what I want you to do is this. Tell me some things you learned about the heart and character of God in that little exercise. Just yell them out. He loves you. Yeah. He, he what? He, he sees you. What'd you say? He cares about you. He knows your condition. He cares about you. Right. What else? He's a healer. Right. So these are things you're learning about his character and his heart. Yeah, he just healed this guy, right? He healed him and then he warned him because he loved him. He knew her condition and he went to her, went to him and he saw her, right? He loves you enough to reveal stuff to you. All of those things, right, are important, right? Now, the last thing you would do is you would pray back to him. You would thank him. You God, thank you, God, for showing me that. Thank you, Lord, that you are a healer, that you do want to make me whole and help me, Jesus, because you've asked me to stay and obey. Can you help me do that? Because I want it. Do you, so do you see how you pray back to him? You know, again, he wants to help you. He's not your drill sergeant or your CEO, right? But he really is trying to teach you how to do these things. Okay, flip your paper back over really quick to this side right here, bottom. Okay, here's what I want to teach you. We just looked at a process. Again, you don't have to write one, two, three, four on your papers. But you do have to go, God, what are some of the things I'm learning in this day? How does that apply to my life? God, what do I learn about you today? And then pray it back. And if you wrote that in your journal tomorrow morning and you just journaled it, even your prayer, right? You will just have sat down and spent time with the Lord. But here's the thing I want to tell you. Kind of beware of the pitfalls. You have an enemy right now while you're in Renew, right? It's all built in. You get up every morning, you come downstairs. But even having it built in, right? You see people there who check out and sleep through devotions, right? Right? who don't really read, right? Who are doing 20 other things, right? So tomorrow when you come down, you're gonna focus on, you're each gonna have a, a one-year Bible. You're gonna go to the New Testament section and that's where you're gonna start. And you're gonna try to do this, okay? You're gonna do exactly what we did here today. I'm actually even, I don't have one in my hand, but I gave you what I call a digging deeper worksheet. Did you guys see them? You should have two because you're going to, for the next four days, they're front and back. It gives you training wheels, I call them. Okay. And so, because you can sit in a workshop and then you go home and you're like, what are we supposed to do? And it just kind of walks you through, write down one or two things. What does that mean to you? What did you learn about the heart of God? And then write your prayer. Okay. So your job for the next four days is to fill those out, right? Instead of writing in your journal and start with the New Testament section of the Bible. If you don't get anything out of that, go to the Old Testament or the Psalm. But beware of the pitfalls, especially when you leave here, right? Um, the enemy will do whatever he can to keep you from spending time in God's word because he knows God's word is going to change you. So I want you to do your best to protect that time, you know. Watch things that are going to try to squish out your time with Jesus. That's one. You get busy, right? You got to go to work. You need your sleep, whatever. It just squishes out your time with the Lord. But the other thing that he loves to do is he loves to use condemnation, right? There's no condemnation in Jesus. If you miss a day, right, don't go back and try to catch up. If you're reading the one year, just start on that day. God wants you to spend time with him. And although it might be something you initially discipline yourself to do, right? I don't want it to be another stressful activity. I don't want you to just like, I got to do my devotions, right? And checking off a list because really um, God doesn't get mad if you miss a day reading your Bible. He's not mad at you. I used to think he was. He just misses you. 
and you miss the opportunity to be with him. The goal is fellowship, right? Not accomplishment. It's not like I checked off devotions, right? That goal is to spend a few minutes. Some days you may not have time. So just read the Psalm, just read the proverb, just grab a hold of something and chew on it. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to turn this 